Picked has made a commitment that uh, October from now on will be October Shakespeare. We've committed to provide Pittsburgh at least once in the year with one major pre presentation of Shakespeare. So why insist on doing Shakespeare? Well, of all playwrights, Shakespeare is probably the greatest playwright the world has ever known. And his greatness comes not just from his language and from the beauty of his language, but also for the fact that rather than demonstrating the, uh, the activities, the successes of people who were happened to be kings and princes and queens and gods and demons, Shakespeare's plays are always based on the humanity of the characters and how they achieve greatness and how they achieve failure. But it is always centered on the fact that these are just ordinary human beings in extraordinary situations. Macbeth is a play about ambition. Macbeth is a play about vaulting ambition. It's a play about a man being given a prophecy that no matter what happens, he's gonna get more titles and end up king. The problem is his ambition overtakes the prophecy because he, does, he doesn't read the, the fine print. You know, always when you get a contract, read the small print. And he believes that because a prophecy has happened, he is invincible. That this is the fates, the heavens, whatever, guaranteeing his future. But as I say, he doesn't read the small print. He gets everything they promise, but pays the price for it. The small print is usually the price you pay. But Shakespeare demonstrates that, that, that the human condition, human frailty, will allow you to overreach yourself always. And when you do that, you pay. One of the center points I hope for this production is that I believe and indeed my actors believe in the power of the word. So I take my lead or my, my, my guideline for any production of Shakespeare straight from the words that Shakespeare gives us. The words are beautiful, the words are exquisite, the composition is magnificent, but more importantly Shakespeare almost defines the action by the way he writes the word. The words will guide you. He uses this wonderful verse form called iambic pentameter, which is basically five double beats to a line. De-dum, 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 de-dum. And the way the lines are written almost tell you where the emphasis of the line should go, where the emphasis of the word should go, and where the action of the line should go. So I think for anybody who is a student of Shakespeare, You'll, you'll, be, you'll be very happy with the fact that the actors are working very much to the guideline of Shakespeare's words. We're not trying to be clever with them. We're not trying to be remarkably inventive. What we're doing is presenting Shakespeare in the way Shakespeare wrote it. For those who haven't really a lot of experience of Shakespeare, maybe they, they read some in high school or had to study some in college, but for those of, uh, of the audience who, who are not what one may say Shakespeare aficionados, I think you'll find it interesting because of the clarity of it. People are a little afraid of Shakespeare and there's no need to be. After all, most uh, he really invented an awful lot of the way we speak English today. Um, he invented 1,700 words that we use today, uh, in, like glamorous. <laughs> um, he invented the unword. Before Shakespeare, there was no record of anybody saying un something, unjust, unfair. He, he, he invented that construct. So an awful lot of the language is a lot simpler and more accessible than you would expect. It's just a matter of listening. Also, we do not present Shakespeare like a museum piece. 
We're not all dressed up in doublet and hose and Elizabethan costume. This is vibrant and active theater. For instance, when you come to see it, uh, the costumes, the set are vibrant. They are accessible. This is a particularly barbaric play, so the whole look of the play it's not set in any particular time, it's not set in any particular place, it's set in a mood. Of course, the first question everybody asks when you're doing Macbeth is, who's playing Macbeth? Well, in this production, I'm very fortunate. I have David Whalen playing Macbeth. And David is such a dynamic actor. He has tremendous physicality. He's physically very powerful. He's physically um, very agile. Uh, David's got a huge degree of experience as an actor. And one of the joys of directing him as Macbeth is that he has a, an incredible facility for the use of language. He reads words off a page that become totally internalized. He all, he is, does that very rare thing amongst actors that he does bring the character into and through himself. It's always the same actor on the stage, but some actors have that wonderful capacity to take the energy of the words and translate it through themselves. So David is, I think, going to be quite uh, a majestic Macbeth. For Lady Macbeth, who is always very often thought of as the arch villainess in Shakespeare and certainly the worst hostess, uh, I've decided to cast somebody who is better known for the simplicity of her look. She is extremely beautiful, extremely delicate, uh, and uh, that's Gail Pazersky. And when you see the, this, this wonderful, exquisite actress summoning demons, plotting murder, driving her husband forward, forcing him to do things he doesn't really want to do, you'll find it really quite shocking, which is what it should be. It should surprise. It's very easy to cast, obviously. It is much, much more exciting to cast unexpectedly. And so that was my choice for, for Gail on that basis. Of other characters in the play, Macduff, uh, Banquo, even uh, King Duncan, uh, I'm using actors who have the capacity for the use of the word, to be able to explain, because really with Shakespeare, Shakespeare is explaining ideas to you all the time. So I'm using actors such as James Fitzgerald, Martin Giles, uh, um, Justin Holcomb, uh, Patrick Jordan, actors who have a capacity to play with words and play with the ideas of the words and at the same time look extremely dangerous. One of the great theatre traditions, and we have thousands of them, but one of the great traditions is that uh, Macbeth is an unlucky play. And uh, again, a tradition is you don't say the name of it. Now, I have just been saying it uh, quite a lot on this very stage because I, I never, I'm not a superstitious person. But the tradition is that you wouldn't even mention it. You call it the Scottish play or the play about the Scottish king or some other, or Mackers or any other um, uh, variant on that so that you don't say the name Macbeth. It comes from the fact, I think, that certainly in the 17th, 18th century when there were productions of Macbeth being done, Macbeth, there are a lot of fights in Macbeth and a lot of new use of knives and swords and what have you. So of all the plays of Shakespeare, more people were more likely to get injured in Macbeth than any other play, simply because there were more swords and more battles. Um, so I think it got the, uh, I think it got the, um, the name of being unlucky from that. It just, we just, it, Macbeth seemed to kill more actors than any other play. Um, personally, I don't believe it, although there have been many um, uh, accounts of it. There was a, a, a famous account of one very well-known actor putting on a production of Macbeth on Broadway, and uh, he'd hired three Haitian witch doctors to play the witches. And uh, he got a bad review from one critic, and he walked into the theater the next day, and the three witch doctors were sitting on the stage, chanting. And they couldn't speak 
much English, and he asked their, their, their sort of minder, what are they doing? And they said, oh, they're chanting the critic to death. And uh, <laughs> that was laughed off, and about four days later, the critic had a heart attack and died. about this production. The way we, the motion that we use, we are playing not just with space but with time as well. And for instance, um, all the fight sequences in the play are very carefully choreographed and you're going to see a kind of physical action that you wouldn't normally expect. We will be using almost cinematic uh, ideas such as slow motion and stop frame, but we're doing it with live actors on a live stage right in front of you. So that that will adds a dynamic to it as well that is purely theatrical. You couldn't do that uh, in any other medium. You're watching actors perform Shakespeare live and dynamically, both in terms of the use of the word and in the use of their own movement. play is actually about ambition and I, uh, I don't want everybody swirling around in Scottish kilts and putting on phony Scottish accents so because it gets in the way of the play itself so we're not doing any of that I am setting it in a barbaric place because the play is barbaric uh, it is a, in a period where one didn't uh, settle things by negotiation you settle things by whacking somebody with a sword um, Therefore, I'm taking a look that is in itself barbaric. We're going to rep, the whole stage will be represent a place of stone, of rock, of hardness. Uh, I'm using uh, slight Irish allusions in that uh, part of the set will be taken modeled on the Giant's Causeway in, in Northern Ireland. Um, stone, they walk on stone, they climb on stone, they are surrounded by stone. Uh, the costumes, again, I, I, I've mentioned before that uh, a kind of motivation behind it was the sort of look that you get in, say, Game of Thrones. It's, it's a time of warriors, a time of barbarism. So the, uh, even the very look of the costumes is going to be somewhat closer to that. But it's to demonstrate every time you put a set on the stage or a costume on an actor, it's got to tell a story. And the story this says, this tells, is of cruelty, of violence, of ambition, and of barbarism. started to examine the text for a different production a long time ago, I divided the play into segments. Uh, rather than worrying about the, the acts and scenes that you get in printed versions, because they were added at the time they were published, they were not necessarily designated by Shakespeare. So I divided the play into five parts. And the first part is called the prophecy. And the prophecy matters because Macbeth is given a, a glimpse into the future. You have the character of the, what are called the Weird Sisters. We now call them the witches, but that's how they're described, the Weird Sisters. And what the Weird Sisters do is tell him three things. They tell him who he is, they tell him who he will become soon, and they tell him who he will eventually be. They say he is Thane of Glamis. Well, he is. They say he will be Thane of Corda. But it's pretty common knowledge that the Thane of Corder is a traitor and is going to be executed, and that Macbeth is the national hero, so it's likely that he will get his title. And they say that he will become king hereafter. But the king is an old man, and Scotland was an elective monarchy. All the lords and lords got together at the end uh, of a king's life and elected his successor. So it was pretty reasonable that they might suggest that Macbeth would be king. 
The problem of the play is that when he hears the prophecy, he decides to act on it. And so you move to the second segment of the play, the murder. And the murder is the political assassination of the king. Macbeth, convinced by his wife that we should do it now rather than wait, takes a political decision. It's a bit like, you know, the, the godfather. It's business. It's not personal. It's business. He likes the king. He thinks he's a great king. He's, a, he's related to the king. The king is a guest in his house, but he follows what we might call uh, the ambitious expedient of removing the king so that he can become the king. After this comes the problem. He is king, but he's not happy because he knows that his best friend is going to become father to a line of kings. Macbeth and his wife have no children. It's suggested, in fact, in the script that they had children, but they died. So Macbeth has no future, whereas Banquo, his friend, does. That angers Macbeth. Why should he have a future? So instead of behaving in a kingly fashion, he chooses to murder his friend. And we call that section the betrayal. Because in order to make himself stronger, he starts to betray his principles, he betrays his own honor, and he betrays his friend. At the end of that sequence, we move into the fourth, which we call the genocide. Macbeth is brought back to the witches, the weird sisters, and demands to know more. He wants to know how strong he is, how safe he is, having started down this particular uh, line of attack by killing his friends. And he's given three more prophecies. He is told to beware Macduff, another lord and another friend. He is told that he cannot be defeated until Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane Hill, a thing which Macbeth considers impossible. It's very important. They don't say it will never happen. They give him a timeline. They say he's absolutely safe until. But again, he doesn't read the fine print. And they give him a third prophecy that he cannot be killed by anyone born of a woman. And of course, he says everybody's born of a woman. Therefore, I cannot be killed. And he then sets out, knowing, believing in his absolute security on what we can only call the genocide. Macduff's family is wiped out. He doesn't just try to kill Macduff, who escapes. He kills his wife, his children, his servants, his cattle, everything. And that is a classic example of what happens when you move from dictatorship to megalomania. It goes crazy, and that has happened in Kosovo. It's happened in Rwanda. It happened in Cambodia. It happens anywhere where Absolute power is granted to one person who becomes absolutely corrupt. And everybody around him take, has responsibility taken away from them. You can do what you like, it's okay. And then that, that infects the world with evil. And then the final segment of the play is called The Revenge. I could call it The Redemption, but it's not. It's Malcolm, the son of Duncan, taking revenge on Macbeth. It's Macduff taking revenge on, Macbeth, on Macbeth. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about understanding. It's not about anything to do with the politics. It's about the human condition. You did that to me. I'm going to do it to you. So the solution to violence is another act of violence. And that, I argue, brings the play its full circle and it will repeat again and again and again because we never learn that violence doesn't solve anything. One of the things about classic theatre is that we will always tend to do plays that have been seen before. And I think it's vital to understand that it is not simply the play that you are seeing, or shall we say, a, a presentation of that script. Every production of every play is unique. 
And when a play is classic, when it comes from the past, it is classic because it was true of its time, but it is true of all time. And re-experiencing play, the plays of Shakespeare, plays like Macbeth or King Lear or Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet, you're not just seeing that title, you're not just seeing that script. What you're seeing is a new set of artists, a new set of creative minds coming to those words and reimagining them again for you at this time in this place. So each production, each production, Shakespeare has been presented on stage regularly for over 400 years. Sophocles has been presented on stage regularly for two and a half thousand years. They're not the same play. The plays that were presented two and a half thousand years ago or 400 years ago were true of their time. But those same words are true of our time as well. Even a play that you might have seen 10 years ago or 20 years ago, its context, its meaning, its intention will be as relevant to today's circumstance as they were then, but through the eyes of new artists, new interpreters, new designers, a whole new team of theatrical thinkers. And that is why these plays can be seen again and again and again and always be fresh and new.